Good. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to uh, you know, have this panel and have you with us uh, this morning. We have a great group um, of, uh, of business leaders talking about the global business context. And um, let me just briefly introduce them. I'm Hans Berkner, the CEO of the Boston Consulting Group. And then we have uh, John Chambers, the chairman and CEO of Cisco. Tom Anders, the CEO of Airbus. Klaus Kleinfeld, chairman and CEO of Alcoa. Duncan Niedauer, the CEO of uh, New York Stock Exchange Euronext. Ferit uh, Schenk, the chairman of Doge Group. And last but not least, uh, uh, Patricia Wirtz, the chairman, president and CEO of Archer Daniels Midland. We will talk about the, the global business context and I uh, ask the different business leaders about their perspective on, you know, not just the world economy, but how they do in this very difficult business environment. The opportunities, the challenges, and what are the, the key changes they, they do in their strategies, their organizations, their operations, in order to make it work. As some of my colleagues are in their quiet period, uh, they will uh, publish results for uh, the last quarter and, and last year in a few days' time, or next week, or in two weeks' time, they will have to um, avoid any um, um, specific questions on, the, um, on their specific results, and I hope you bear with them. So we'll start with a, a series of opening remarks, then have a discussion within the group about the key opportunities and challenges, and then uh, in the third uh, part uh, of the discussion, we'll open it up to questions to the audience. So, and I would like to start with Klaus, Klaus with you, and uh, have your perspectives on your specific business and, and the world. Yeah, I think uh, when this panel was put together, the big question was, as always in Davos, what's new? I mean, how do you, how do you all have to reshape your business? And, uh, and uh, frankly, I think there are a couple of new things that have come out more strongly, but there are also a couple of things that we have to remind ourselves of to not forget. And uh, I would start with that one, which I would call the new true north, and it hasn't changed at all. I've always talked about the mega trends, I mean, and that they continue. They continue to set the undertone. I mean, we're going to have three billion people more on this planet very soon. We, they, almost all of them are going to live, or the majority is going to live in urban environments. That is changing drastically. We're going to have a big amount of middle class. And that sets a true new north for our companies. That is still there and will be there for, I would say, at least the next 20 years. But it is important for uh, companies and leaders to adjust to that. I mean, you have to look at those markets, that you are present in those markets, expand in those markets. And for us, I mean, it's not just the end customer markets, but it's also looking at how, uh, how are some markets changing that are important for some of the supply goods for us. And I'm talking, for instance, about energy here. Uh, so this is, this is the, the new true north, and I believe it's still there. It's there as it was there last year. But we have to remind ourselves of this and build it in to our decisions. What's new? What is new, in my view, is we live in a 25-8 world. And I'm saying that <coughs> a little tongue-in-cheek because I don't know how you feel, <coughs> but talking to some of my CEO colleagues, I feel that 24-7 isn't enough to cope with what's going on here anymore, you know, you, particularly with, with all the news that's coming in and the different news feeds have given pretty much everybody in their, in their private room, no matter how small it is, access to the world, and they can literally change the world, absolutely change the world. And that's true uh, in, 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 in every environment. It's true for politicians, as we've seen last year, and, and some have been very surprised by it, but I think it's equally true as we've seen uh, for, for businesses. I don't think we can grasp it at that point in time. We can grasp some of these things. And I don't think that we have a real good strategy around it, but I think we can grasp some of these things. And, and in my view, it's kind of in 25-8, you can't fake. Because in a way, it's going to come out. You just don't know how. And you saw it last year with WikiLeaks has set a new, new norm in this regards um, for the things that could come out. And uh, I think we've got to live with that. Um, the, the question it brings back is you literally have to, wherever you go, you have to learn your, your, earn your license to operate. And you do it through your actions. And it brings the fundamentals back. And I, I think you cannot 
you cannot believe that even you have an issue somewhere, you can brush it over and, and be nice and move on. I think if the fundamentals are problematic, they will come out. So you have to uh, work very, very closely with your customers, with your employees, have a very active communication policy around it, and literally make sure that uh, society understands how do you add value. And it starts with the simple things. If your employees don't believe that you are adding value, I think you've lost the battle. If your customers don't speak positively about you, <coughs> you've lost the battle. So the other thing that's new, and we saw it very painfully last year, is the volatility. The volatility that we see throughout the world, metal price dropped by 28% last year. <coughs> Currencies have been going, I mean, like crazy, and we are dealing with it. So let me leave it like this and start with that, and we have ample time to discuss Good. that. Ferret, you, you provide our emerging markets view, or uh, the view from an emerging markets uh, country, and you know how you see things. Turkey has been growing very strongly, and, and your group, the Doge group, has been growing also very strongly. Uh, well, as you said, I come from Turkey. Our group is diversified in many fields. For some people, this was a big debate for conglomerates to survive. I think uh, we are one of the examples that conglomerates who are divested in many areas, from banking to automotive to media and others, can survive if they have the dynamic human capital backed by technology to serve the customer end. And one thing is changing the last 10 years. Maybe I should start from a, just Turkey, not too much emerging markets, is that we had our own crisis in 2001. Probably what is now going through in Europe, we had it in 2001. We pretty much knew on paper what to do. But what was the most important thing, Turkey's success, I think, came from the political stability, leadership in politicians, who <coughs> helped the business world also to implement the changes in their organizations. Turkey did a lot of reforms. Turkey changed from a uh, <coughs> state-run economy to more private economy. and it gave us chance to implement as organizations to do our own changes. And when you look at the emerging markets from the 90s, we had three, four crises up to now. And we learned our lessons from crisis. We know how to manage through crisis. Our organizations are more flexible than maybe uh, some of uh, my colleagues in this panel. So what we are doing is that we took family businesses to a more professional standard. But what is keeping the dynamism running in our businesses is the fact that we are run 80% professionally, but that 20%, the drive, the entrepreneurship, and the flexibility that we have is making us still grow and invest even under these turbulent environments. Of course, 2001, we had to restructure our organizations, we had to merge companies, we had to sell companies, we had to get our cash flow balance sheet in order. So we came into this 2008 crisis in a different form. So what we are doing, actually, I come from a 75 million populated country where today 35 million internet users are present. The second or third, I'm not sure, Facebook users are from Turkey. So the young demographics of Turkey the demographic advantage that we have, the most uh, domestic uh, demand, backed by international oriented organizations like us. Now we are taking our step to a region. We are doing this in two ways. Yes, there are risks. Yes, people are uncertain. Yes, people are pulling out of certain markets. And people like us, without losing the risk appetite, without risk ma uh, management and so forth, or liquidity management, we are looking into markets maybe the opposite from many people in the world. I think this is the cliche or the, the word for the emerging markets. We are still looking at growth. Our markets are growing, but also regionally we are tapping uh, growing markets. Uh, in banking, we have created a very good partnership with a Spanish bank, BBVA. We are now Soon, actually, today, I may not give you the name, 
signing an MOU with an e-commerce.com company coming from Asia. Uh, we are signing in a couple of weeks an energy uh, contract, a partnership with a European energy group. So <coughs> we are using our know-how domestically, but we are now expanding in the region. I don't want to go into too much about the uh, world. The only thing that I can tell you, each of us want to live better. Each of us want to do better for our kids. So I know that with the collective wisdom, the world is going to get better. With this confidence, I think that what you're seeing in the emerging market players is that we are becoming more confident where certain Western players lost confidence, so we are closing the gap between the developed market players and the emerging market players. But one thing should not be forgotten. Success should not bring too much optimism, and we should always look at the world as one, not as developed world or emerging markets. Thank you. Thanks, okay, you encourage us to jump in as we go. I just want to echo what Farid said about Turkey. It is probably, along with China, the most effective emerging market in the world with government and business working toward the same objectives. You see the Chamber of Commerce being very effective there. It's a model that, candidly, we in Europe and in the U.S. could learn a lot from. Good. Tom, you have a, a full order book, so you should be really relaxed. <laughs> Absolutely. And, uh, <laughs> and more, I should say. It, aviators are uh, systemic optimists, otherwise nobody would have ever taken to the skies, and the same goes for the entire, entire industry. But there's reason for that. We are in a, in a, in a very much in a long-term growth industry. I mean, we, we've done projections, Boeing's done similar projections, GE, others, basically says in the, in the next 20 years, there's a requirement for something to up to 29,000, 30,000 new large aircraft, aircraft with more than 100 seats capacity. Now, most of that growth is obviously happening in Asia Pacific, uh, in, in the Middle East. Lots of that will also be happening in, in, in Europe and in North America. But uh, we are today already, even though most of our employment is still in Europe, very much focused on Asia uh, Pacific. I'll give you one idea. We uh, delivered, out of our 534 commercial deliveries last year, we delivered more than 100 planes to China alone. Uh, not talking about the entire region. So roughly 40% of our order book today is in China uh, Pacific, 11% in Europe, 11, 12% in, in North America. So this is why there is this uh, optimism. You can, we have a nice pie chart. Uh, that pie chart says, okay, here's the mature aviation market. That's about a billion people, North America, Western Europe, Southeast Asia. And look at the six billion, the aviation has just started. We are at the outset of, of aviation. And, and that makes us so, so optimistic that, yes, recessions and crises and yeah. wars may happen. They flip on the, on the time scale. Uh, but uh, aviation should be, should be a great growth industry. But you, you also mentioned when we did talk last week, you talked about some concerns. You know, maybe you could also share about this. Oh, abs absolutely. Well, one concern and one, uh, one of the changes we observe is uh, in financing. Well, most airlines uh, don't pay new aircraft out of their cash flow. Uh, they need financing. Um, and obviously here we see an impact of the, of the Euro crisis. We've seen that very clearly with some banks in Europe uh, last year. And I think what we're doing right now, this is a process underway. And I think this is not just a short-term thing, can you help us in this actual crisis, but that goes in sync with the, the shift of markets uh, to, to Asia and Pacific that we look for more financing from China, from Japan. Scandinavian banks are interested going directly to the capital markets rather than working uh, through banks. So that is something uh, I think all of us in aviation are actively uh, working on. And I'm, I'm optimistic on that one as well because I think there's no scarcity of, of capital in this world. It's just that we need to look at uh, where do we source from uh, in the future and where do airlines, our customers, source from. Thanks very much, Tom. Duncan, a very particular business that you are representing here, the financial markets, and, and how do you see the environment? It's not an easy one. Obviously, we will not ask you about the 
exact state of the transaction that you're working on. But yeah, uh, thanks. En enough other people will do that the next few days, so I appreciate you giving me a free pass on that. Uh, I, I think before I get into our industry specifics, just a, a little bit of perspective on what we've all lived through the last 10 to 20 years, right? If you if you dial the clock back a little bit, and you think about you know how companies were measured 10 or 20 years ago. If you, if you had a good product and you delivered that product at a fair price, your customers were happy. They didn't really ask much more of you in most cases. That was good enough to be competitive and to be a leader. Nowadays, that's not enough because people now expect on top of that, what, how, what, what's your social impact? Are you a good corporate citizen? You know, how are you going about your business? And to echo what Klaus said, I thought was very interesting, whether it's 24-7 or you adopt a 25-8 philosophy, what it means is we're all being watched in real time. So as, as you said, Klaus, you know, none of us can fake it, right? Like the, everyone's too smart that if you pretend you're having a positive social impact, but you're really not, it's just words, everyone sees right through it. And w we think, as we look at businesses, and we have the luxury of sitting in the seat we sit in where we meet people from all different industries and really all, uh, and, and all around the world, that we think that's in large part going to determine the winners and losers, how people see you, you know, being a good corporate citizen. Specific to our industry, I, I think one of, the, one of the things that we talk a little less about than we did a few years ago, but to me is more relevant than ever for reasons I'll get to in a minute, is deleveraging appears to be here to stay. And when you combine deleveraging with the increase in capital requirements that the financiers are going to be subject to going forward, that comes at a pretty challenging time because it is going to choke the access to capital for SMEs. Obviously, we all know in the room here, SMEs are the primary job creation engine. And that is the world's single biggest problem right now is job creation, and yet we're being asked to do that at a time when the traditional sources of funding are not what they were and don't look like they're going to be what they have been. So from our company's point of view, we look at that and try to tie these two issues. How can we make a social impact? And given that that's the world's largest issue, how can we play a role in that? And what we say is let's get back to our roots. What exchanges have historically been around the world is they were at the center of capital formation. They were the enterprises that connected entrepreneurs and, theirs, and their ideas to capital and investors. And if we can get back to doing that successfully, and some of that's going to be harder in certain places because it may mean you have to dial back legislation or reinvent legislation so that people think it's an attractive alternative again. But you look at a place like where we're sitting in Europe where 70% of the financing has come from the banks for these SMEs. If, if, if they turn off that faucet, the capital markets suddenly become a very, very viable and necessary um, part of that uh, access to capital. And that gets us back to our roots of capital formation. And lastly, I think one of the things we all are certainly aware of is globalization just allows us to extend our footprint in ways in any industry that in ways that would have been unimaginable before the technology revolution, what an enabler. If you had thought about the classic New York Stock Exchange 10 years ago and where we'd have a footprint today in all regions of the world, Asia, Europe, Latin America, Eastern Europe, um, a growing presence in places like Africa, it's, it would have been unthinkable. And, and it's just easier and easier to do that. And I think if you tie that all back, it means that we can take this job creation initiative on in a way where we can make a difference globally because we operate so many markets around the world that I think few companies would be well positioned to do it with credibility. And if we get it right, it will be a collaborative effort uh, because we can't do it without all the companies and without the various government officials. And then it gets back to where I started, which is then, then you can really measure your social impact. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks very much, Todd. Thank you. Pat, again, the global business that you're representing, uh, but a very different business from, from the others. So how, how do you see the world? And how do you well, see I was very world? impressed with my colleagues starting with the long term, or quite a few of them, um, because I think the long term, it's often when you have difficulties in the short term that you lose sight of that. Uh, certainly with world population growth and with wealth creation and the middle class growing, that is an inevitable trend. Population growth is actually an inevitable trend we see. And as a company that worries about how the world will feed itself, uh, a food company, an agricultural company, 
uh, we see that agriculture has a huge opportunity to contribute to that uh, that growth in population and the good of the world that will be needed to be able to provide food and energy. Uh, it will be done by infrastructure investments, uh, investments in different parts of the world. Uh, technology will help. A variety of things will help. Um, if you think about where that population growth is, if you had a map of the world and where all the population growth is and where the crops in the world are grown, they're very, very mm -hmm. different. So a company like ours uh, looks at the long term in this interconnectedness in connecting the harvest to the home. So it's an important to be a global company, be everywhere, uh, try to be uh, part of what a footprint will be when there's difficulties in parts of the world, whether it's weather related, drought related, flood related, uh, civil unrest related, to be able to serve your customers' needs from somewhere else. Um, so what's new about that, what's different in the, in the short term is probably volatility, but maybe in a, a little different way than what even Klaus and uh, uh, others have talked about. We see volatility in the commodity markets now being in commodity and in agricultural commodities being driven by things other than the fundamentals, other than the basic supply demand or weather issues or things that I talked about. But um, difficulties in Europe in capital markets affect uh, there are different people investing today than those that moved in the um, agricultural commodity markets. So you really have to have this bifocal vision that allows you to keep the long term in mind, all the importance about growth, all the importance about um, uh, the importance of agriculture and food to serving the vital needs of the world, but at the same time the short term challenges by region and uh, by area are, are, are quite important. I think the one thing that's different maybe in our industry is it resets itself twice a year. It's a, uh, it's a renewable commodity in the northern and southern hemisphere. is planted every year, uh, you know, once in the north and once in the south. So twice a year you get another look at supply in a way that maybe other commodities or other businesses don't have that reset or that ability to reset. Mm. And the fundamentals truly work with farmers. They're attracted by uh, higher prices. They will plant more. They will use technology, fertilizer, the things that help um, uh, make them more productive, sharing best practices across the globe. Uh, waste management is something we've talked about that's uh, quite important. So again, short and long-term issues, but volatility is a, a big one. Great. Thanks very much. Uh, John, the technology industry, lots of changes very fast. You know, you Within a few uh, quarters, you know, some have really lost a lot. You a hero or a villain. Exactly, yes. exactly. So short term, long term, you know, sure. the big challenge for you. So. Well, I'm going to kind of summarize it based on what Klaus through Patricia have said. What we're all saying on this panel is we're in a period of rapid market transitions. There are economic transitions, there are major technology transitions, there are absolutely industry consolidations going on. And one of the most basic transitions I think going on is how we reinvent ourselves as companies. You've all seen statistics, and we refer to it differently up here, but the Fortune 500, the average life expectancy today is 15 years there. Uh, what it says is during these transitions, if you do not change, you get left behind. And there's a tendency during an economic challenging time to do what? Hunker back cut back, be hesitant, just continue doing what you do before. And if you're a competitor, that's exactly what I want you to do. <laughs> but if we're talking about this as businesses, this is exactly what causes you to fall behind. We had 100 great competitors in the 90s, early 90s. All but two of them are gone. We had another dozen that were really tough in 2000. All but two of them are largely gone. And the same thing will be true a decade from now. The question is, does Cisco make that transition? We're trying to transition in our industry from talking about boxes and routers and switches, which I get excited about, Patricia, but you don't. It's how you use this technology around collaboration, around cloud, around video to drive productivity at 5 to 10 percent per year, change healthcare on a global basis, change how you bring expertise to your customers, change your innovation cycle, et cetera. And in the technology industry, those who make that transition will lead. Those who stay doing it the way they used to will very quickly fall behind. Uh, we've 
we've been through a transition this last year. We usually see things, unfortunately, two to four quarters ahead of our peers, and we've done that through each of the challenges, and we changed our company. Uh, so I think the key here is about reinvention. It's about not using IT, but business technology as you go forward. And to echo what one of my colleagues said, as you do this, corporate social responsibility must go hand in hand. Those who have been successful in business usually have done a very good job on corporate social responsibility. We spend 3.75% of our pre-tax earnings on corporate social responsibility. That's $290 million a year. We also happen to be the number one player in Turkey, in China, in Jordan, in India, where we invest at in the United States. So I think the transition going on is very important as businesses. We must also realize we owe an obligation. The most successful must be the most effective given back and give back in concept and transitions, not just in terms of money. That's great. I, John, in some way, of course, in? you're can you can already summarized. In? Sorry, can please. Can I jump in Thank for you, one second? Because I think John made some good points that we've spent a lot of time studying recently. And what, what he just said, I think, is really important for people to focus on because uh, those aren't just words. Like, the, the, the facts back it up. Um, if you go back to one of the things we looked at recently was we were trying to take a look at our own universe of companies, right? The few thousand companies that are listed in the United States, how many of them had around, have been around for more than 100 years, to your point, mm -hmm. right? Because they would have had to reinvent themselves repeatedly during that time. It is shockingly few. It's, it's, in the, it's in the couple of hundreds. And you've got two of them sitting on the panel with us. So Archer Daniels and, and, uh, and Alcoa have both been around you know, for more than 100 years, right? And they're still here. And they've had to constantly reinvent themselves, to, to, to John's point. And if you looked at the Fortune 50 in 1955, almost none of them exist anymore, mm -hmm. right? They're almost all gone. And that was, you know, the Fortune 50. That wasn't just 50 random companies. And the Fortune 50. In existence, most of them for 75 years yeah. at that time. Right. Yeah. And, and the cycle of this change that John is talking about is so much faster. You know, we spent a lot of time internally recently, you know, talking about uh, Codex recent demise, right? And that didn't take place in a half a century. I mean, if we really took a step back, if, if you were, if you think of the mid-90s, virtually everybody was walking around with a camera with Kodak film in it, right? And here we are 15 years later and it's all digital, right? And the world changes. So John's point is a really important one because the global world we live in, enabled by technology, means this required to reinvent is is accelerating because the, 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 you know, the cycle of innovation is so much faster. But yeah. the stats are pretty, pretty compelling, yeah. right? Uh, I mean, John, in some way, of course, you, you summarize some of the, the key points. Of course, globalization is a key issue in order to be successful, and I think we need to dwell a bit on it because it, it's not just easy. It is also a huge uh, challenge for the different organizations. The other is to find the right balance between short and long term and the change. And by the way, when you look at the Fortune 500, you know, in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and the last 10 years, every decade there has been more change in um, you know, in those Fortune 500, and not just in the U.S., in most, almost other, uh, or the other countries too. So I think the, the, uh, the volatility, the change has accelerated uh, over time. Um, and I think also the, the question, how do you, you balance between being careful, maybe making the, the, uh, the tough decisions short term, and, and still, you know, building for the long term, because at the, the moment many are cutting back, um, and of course at the detriment for the long term. When you look at over a 10-year period, you know, the, the key uh, value creation comes from growth. So how do you uh, keep on staying on the growth path while making some, some very painful cuts in the short term? And I think the third uh, important element is, of course, the social impact or the, the uh, uh, being much more uh, attentive to, to the social needs and to, to needs of society. Because we are not just observable, but we also we feel a much greater responsibility and with the with the crisis, you know, uh, having created a bigger divide in society. I mean, business certainly, not only governments, but also businesses under, is under enormous pressure. So maybe we should talk about, you know, how, how do you globalize, how do you create a sense uh, for globalization in the organization? How do you keep the right balance between the short and the long term with all the, the pains? And then the third aspect on the, on the, social, uh, on the social impact side. Mm -hmm. And maybe Tom, you know, given that you talked about the long term, it's very clear the long term uh, issues are very obvious. I mean, and, and, uh, and of course, it's a global industry, but there are enormous tensions. You have also gone through, through some of those uh, issues. Boeing has them. You know, how, how do you deal with How do you create the sense of, of uh, awareness in the organization and keep them on their, on their toes? 
Well, let me first say I feel very privileged to sit here on this panel with these very old companies. Mine is only as a company some 12 years, 12 years old, even though the brand is around a little bit longer. I would say, first of all, globalization for the aviation industry, for the aviation manufacturers in particular, really works. It, it does deliver, but uh, it requires that uh, step by step we have more and more of the value added also in the markets. Mm -hmm. that we serve. The good old days where we could uh, manufacture things in, in Europe or North America and sell them all over the world, do all the procurement in Europe and North America, they're clearly over. Um, so we, we have supply chain elements increasingly in these countries. And the other thing is, it's not just a kind of an offset. I think today we all realize, and maybe the aviation industry is uh, one of the last because we were privileged to be in such a small club that uh, we need to look after the global talent. We want to bind the, the best and brightest people uh, to the companies. This is why we have started some years ago, but only five years ago, I should say, four or five years ago, to put engineering centers in, 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 into these uh, markets to uh, grow the, the number of employees, the number of uh, managers. <clears throat> it is all fine as long as you can present to your company, to your employees, your unions, your local political constituencies that this is win-win. Okay, we go there, we have more business, uh, but there's also more business than back home uh, to serve these markets. It becomes much more difficult and then you have to, when more leadership is obviously required, then it's no longer uh, a win-win. In other words, if you have to make trade-offs and say, okay, I have to take employment away in my home markets uh, and go into these emerging markets. We're not yet really at this, in the aviation, I think, in this, in this critical, um, at this critical point, but I can foresee that coming. So far, it has been the growth uh, that uh, allowed a win-win on, uh, on, on, on both sides, but it uh, is coming, and that is something, and I think that is something we will also pick up and learn from other industries who've gone, who've gone through that. First phase, win-win, yes, we'll get more market share, but, but secondly, if your own markets shrink, if these markets, the new markets are more demanding, how do you manage that? Much more leadership, much more vision, obviously, required then than in the easy days of win-win. Mm -hmm. Klaus, you, you have to deal with a lot more volatility, obviously. Yes. You mentioned that prices have been down by 28% for uh, aluminium, um, and uh, I mean, the short-term pains are very real. Um, and still, at the same time, you, you painted at the beginning a clear picture of, you know, the global outlook. You know, every year, 50 to 100 million new consumers entering the, the global market. And, 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 and therefore, you know, the, the, the long-term needs and demands is clear, but the short-term, you know, how do you deal with that? Well, the interesting thing, I've, I've been blessed in my life that I had a lot of uh, opportunities to do restructurings, and I've seen that there is a human element in it that I, I don't believe you can successfully restructure if you don't have a growth part at the same time. Because it's, I mean, humans want to have uh, something to look forward to. And uh, because in the end, I mean, to just cut, 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 I mean, it's, there's, there's no perspective and people will not, will not do it well, right? So I've always believed and always done it to have a growth perspective and have to have a true north for, for I mean, whether it's being small or whether it's being, being big. So that's one thing. The second thing, the volatility ha is huge. And, and you mentioned the aluminum price aspect. Uh, it's added on to it is the currency aspect of it. I and mean, we've seen currency swings last year that I don't think we've seen before. And, uh, and as we are in an industry where our end product uh, is traded in dollars, uh, but the, uh, the input costs are in uh, Brazilian real, Australian dollars, Canadian dollars, you know, euros and, and dollars. US dollars, so there's a lot, lot going on there. I think for us uh, it has a couple of implications. Number one, you have to build a little bit of a bigger buffer. Cash is king and you got to be sure that you stay afloat. I mean, what we saw last year, I mean, when suddenly the metal price drops by 28 percent, wow. I mean, uh, we saw in 2008-2009 a very stable balance sheet where we had a debt-to-cash ratio of about 30 percent, falling in less than six months to 43.9 percent. Right? Honestly, that's an experience that is pretty impressive. You know, we changed over to cash management immediately and brought it back very quickly. But uh, the learning from that is you have to have a little bit more of a buffer there. So as a second learning is in, in the past, I mean, if you had a little flaw on execution and you could afford it and brush it over, you can't anymore. You have to be much more flawless in your, your, on your execution. And the third learning is you got to also look for diversification. Uh, and diversification comes in many ways. I mean, 
um, Pat has mentioned this also through regional diversification, that's one aspect, uh, but also in business diversification, right? And then last but not least, uh, I believe and have believed it for many, many years that in today's world, the only sustainable competitive advantage is the talent base. It's your employees, it's your people. You have to do an outstanding job to select the right individuals, and you have to select them by not only being great in their performance, but also being good in working together. Nobody is perfect, but a team can be. And the third thing is you have to be much, much more conscious on the value side. I mean, we've always praised ourselves, and I believe, by the way, that that's one of the determining factors uh, how companies can survive over a longer period in time. I don't, think that, I don't think they can survive if they are not truly, and in the essence, a values-based company, and if they haven't got a good capability to attract the best and brightest. Great. Farid, you, you have um, emphasized, I think, the, the, the restructuring needs in 2001, so you have gone through the crisis. Um, I mean, what are the lessons that you would, would say, you know, other companies, I mean, in Europe, uh, but also in, in the rest of the world, can learn um, making the painful decisions in order to really build for the future? Is that something where you feel, um, you know, your lessons are, you know, those, the lessons also for others, which could be applied now? Uh, thank you. Obviously, for us to change, uh, we needed a sense of urgency. And... This had to be communicated within the organization. So the type of change you want to do on paper could be actually implemented in the workplace. I mean, you can make a decision at the top, but the people who are going to make the change are the people facing the customers. They're going to give the answers about why the company is doing this and that. And you have to give leadership within the organization to do this, maybe sometimes the crucial hard jobs. But beyond that, I think for this change to occur, I think what is important, <coughs> uh, like it happened in Turkey, country was going through a change. It was not only a financial crisis, it was a structural change. Mm -hmm. So if this did not happen, I think maybe even our company would not need to change because at that time, that type of working environment, we were doing fine. So when the country started changing, when the leadership, the political leadership decided that this type of economic environment with this structure could not go on, we also had to adapt to it. I think the first thing is that macro picture, the government is very important. Secondly, the communication of crisis is very important within your organization. Thirdly, you have to really show quick gains to your organization. Otherwise, the believers whom we are preaching to they will start falling to pieces. As uh, I think everybody knows in business, you can always find money. But the belief of people, the trust of people within your organization, because in this type of uh, periods, nobody's looking at elsewhere. They are looking at the leader. Leader has to stand on the truth. I think the communication of this is very important. I come from a family business. And at the time of the crisis, Unfortunately, my father passed away. So our thing was, a, I'm the second generation. Uh, so there were a lot of expectations, unexpected beliefs and non-beliefs towards the new guy or the new leadership and his team. So this was a little bit challenge for us. Uh, I think for the change to occur, you have to walk to talk. And this is what we did. It was easier for us to change because we were not a public company. Uh, no invested banking or no capital markets were measuring us. There was not much critics towards us. So we could make the change. But I think when you become a, a public company, and our holding company is not public, it's a different ball game. You, you can take a little bit different decisions. Our bank is public. Our automotive companies are public. We have public entities underneath. But I think on the top, we have to take the hard decisions. Okay. Tom and then John, you wanted to... Yeah, I just wanted, wanted to pick up on that, um, restructuring. We, we ran through a major restructuring from 2006, 7 until, until 10, in the, uh, in the course of which we took uh, roughly 10,000 people of our payroll. It's only 20, almost 20 percent of the, the employees. Um, it worked because, um, I think Klaus said it, uh, we, had, we, we could give our people the vision, the vision is growth. 
people, we're not in a declining industry. We're still a young industry. If we are competitive, uh, we will prevail, we will survive, and we will lead uh, the industry. Uh, but was, so, so the vision was really growth, and particularly in the, in the emerging markets. The other thing that was important in this period, and was also important in the crisis, financial crisis period 2008-09, <coughs> say, stay close to the customer. Stay close to the customer. The customer never uh, errs and never is getting irritated about uh, your commitment, uh, your future. That was so damn important. Uh, and also the supply chain, so that the supply chain does not come up with their own guessing of what the, the future will be. Mm. If, if, you keep, if, if you keep that, stay close to the customer, uh, keep close, inform the supply chain, and uh, have a dialogue with the supply chain, I think it's very important through restructuring periods, but also in, in periods of uh, immediate crisis. Mm -hmm. John? Yeah. Key takeaways, you asked for the playbook, it's pretty simple, uh, and we all worded it in different ways. The first is, when it's an opportunity or a challenge, be realistic on how much was self-inflicted, how much was macro. Second is... And it's mostly self-inflicted? It varies by situation. <laughs> no, uh, not necessarily. Yeah. Uh, but you want to be realistic, what's the trade-off? The second thing you want to do is determine how long you think it's going to last and how deep it will be. And that's whether it's a market transition, technology transition, or economic. And it's usually as deeper and longer than you anticipate. The third thing you do is, I think several of my colleagues painted very well, you paint your picture of what you want to look like when you come out. You communicate it to your employees again, again, again. And the fifth thing is you stay close to your customers. That's the playbook for all of us. However, Farad, I thought you were very modest. Every one of us, whether we're public or private, if you make the decision what's right for your company long term, it shouldn't matter which one you're in. And you might face a little bit of heat from your shoulders in the short term, but you, if you do your job right, every decision you make is three to five years out. Almost no decision you make has a huge impact in the next six months. So I think the playbook's remarkably replicatable. Mm -hmm. But I mean, obviously, you're in a business where the demand can only grow. Uh, and so you should be uh, less worried. But I mean, what are the short-term challenges and, and you know, the, the trade-offs between short-term and long-term? Well, you... while we say it can only grow, it doesn't grow in a straight line. <laughs> so you have the fits and starts. Yeah. And uh, even though it's a cyclical business often, uh, just as John said, to be realistic about when you're in the low part of a cycle, what you can do, what you can control versus what is part of the macro environment is a debate that you have to have and you have to have it in a healthy way and an honest way. We talk about earning the right to grow. And so in the organizations that really have understood the macro versus the self-inflicted, mm -hmm. have really analyzed the people that are very good at that to understand as you go mm. through cycles. They've earned the right to grow and do so even in down cycles. So we allocate more capital and invest more capital even in down cycles for the long term, particularly those areas and those managers that have understood that and have earned that, that right. Mm -hmm. Duncan, how, how are you dealing with, with the, I mean, obviously the long term prospects are, I would say, still good, you know, despite the, you know, the challenges at the moment. But I mean, there are enormous short term challenges. Right, but uh, I, I think we're um, perhaps being a little too pessimistic. I think if you, if you look at I know it's, I, I think I said last last year or the year before, boy, if it, you, you come here consistently as an optimist and this place can wring optimism out of you in three or four days, right? You, you, you come here as an optimist and if you, if you, if you leave uh, um, an optimist, you're in the minority. But I mean, I, I think if you look, look, the, we've, we've touched a lot on volatility, that volatility that's been the manifestation of all the uncertainty in parts of the world you know, slow down what was setting up to be a very good year in the capital markets. And, and that's the engine, right, that we've talked about. It, it sounds like we're talking our own book when we talk about the exchange industry, but the facts are pretty clear. You know, I think Ferret's right. There are some challenges with being a public company. You have to be a little more transparent. You know, J John said it right. I don't think it's that big a difference because if we're all doing our jobs and we're managing for the long term, it's not that big a deal. But the facts are pretty clear. Companies that go public use that growth capital to grow, which means they create jobs, which means that's really, really important. So if you look at our pipeline, for example, the next six to 12 months, and I'm sure it's true of other exchanges around the world, it's very global. It's small, medium, and large companies. It's companies that if we can just kind of hang in there this year, and it's, it's modest GDP growth and a little less volatility, and we all get used to the new normal, 
I think you could have a very, very positive year. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, yes, Klaus is right. It's the prudent thing to do to, to say that cash is king when we're still uncertain. But the fact is, corporate balance sheets in the world have not been this healthy for a long time. And I'm more optimistic than most. I think it's very easy to have a breakout on the upside here if we get used to the new normal or some sense that things are less uncertain. And, and, and the pipeline that we've got in front of us for the next, of issuance for the next six, nine, 12 months, very, very strong. And I think we'll give people a good illustration where they can hang their hat on it and say, you know, there is a way to move forward here. Yeah. Good. You know, Duncan's being very polite also, so I'll, I'll always say it in a more direct way. Government and business are not working well together in Europe, in the U.S., or in India. And we have to get back to the basics on that because our counterparts around the world are out executing us. And that does give us the upside breakout if we're able to deal with issues crisply and with certainty in each of the areas. And that gives probably failing marks at the present time. Yeah. And the funny thing is, John, we don't need a sea change from Washington, at least looking at the, through the U.S. lens, right? We just need a, a turning of the dial a little bit because the, the fundamentals are there. We just need we just need everyone to stop villainizing it and just like there's a there's a really easy way forward here if everyone's just constructive. I'm with you. But, but let me build on this. I think is there a misconception by business about? I mean, you talked about you know making small adjustments. I mean, there is a much stronger feeling in Europe, North America, some other parts that the pendulum has to has swung too much in one extreme. You know, business is king. Um, and, uh, and we have an in increasing income inequality, wealth inequality that has developed over the years. And there is the sense of, you know, government has really to push back. There has to be more regulation. There has to be more pushback on, on, on business having a, a free, uh, free lunch. Um, and obviously that's an extreme picture, but I think it's, it's very real. I mean, how, how to deal with, with those challenges, you know, and, and I think... Well, let's, let's not complicate it. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but let's not complicate it, right? It could be as simple as just eradicating the obvious contradiction that you say you love jobs and then in the next breath you say you don't like job creators, I just don't get it. Mm. I'm sorry, I know, I know that's an <coughs> oversimplification. <coughs> if we're all about creating jobs, then why are you going after the job creators? I just, I don't, like if someone can just help us resolve that basic issue, Good people will take care of the rest. With all due respect, I think it's over. Over. Yes, I wanted no, to. I wanted you to, to, to let us interrupt. Yes, exactly. Absolutely, do it. <laughs> so, I think it's very important to realize that business has to play a key role here. Absolutely. Uh, yes. We have to be realistic that we have used the US as, U.S. as an example. We have allowed our middle class to deteriorate, and we've got to get that back. You've got to give the environment where we created 10,000 millionaires at Cisco. That will never be done again the way the current regulations are. How do we create an environment where it wins for everyone and how to be realistic and critical of ourselves because the areas we much do better. But it's a classic approach, which Canley, you do pretty well in Turkey and Chinese doing remarkably well. They get business and government in the same room <coughs> and they work it through and they resolve it. And both sides, to your point earlier, have macro issues but a large part of self-inflicted. So I think it's important we don't talk at each other. We say, how do we solve it together? And, and I think that's really what I'm pushing for. Yeah. I, I almost feel that the societal dialogue we need, and we need it probably more than ever. But I also believe that the tone should not be a tone where it's us against them or uh, this has been taken away and this is going to be given to, because that's really not how the economy works. I mean, you, you need, you will always have businesses and people that pull. And, and they, if you don't have them in your economy, uh, you, you won't have jobs, you won't have businesses, right? Some, some countries have realized that and have created because of that a very smart immigration policy because they realize individuals matter whether you have them there or not and that is and will always be the same right I think the dialogue we absolutely need and I think we need to do it together with the media and business has to engage more in it and at the same time business also has to make sure that it's not just us here on the podium the CEO is talking but a lot of the dialogue happens around the turkey you know on thanksgiving you know when the young kids are coming in that are about to uh, leave leave for, uh, leave leave college in a year from now and are wondering hey do i get an interview do i get a job right and and that's where the answers really happen we need to make sure that our employees are enabled and empowered to give more comfort and give more confidence in where the world is going, or our suppliers or our customers, right? 
and we, I think we really have to engage more in this dialogue and, and not just vilify one area against the other. Yeah, Tom? Can I make a very uh, Eurocentric uh, comment? Um, and very specifically, I think, I have, no, I have no doubt, there is a need for additional regulation in some area of the financial markets. And it has to be done consequentially. And I think we can observe that some of the obvious things that should have been reformed are, are, lacking, are lacking behind. On the other hand, I'm concerned that uh, our politicians, again, primarily in Europe, uh, don't do enough in terms of deregulation. There's so much we can do, particularly here, to fuel growth, to, to, to deregulate particularly the labor market. I mean, as, as the saying goes, uh, it's a terrible thing to, to waste a good crisis. And I'm, I'm afraid that uh, could happen here, that uh, too much regulation, that we end up with more regulation that will strangle, suffocate growth, mm. and that politicians are not willing to, to tackle the deregulation issue. That is unpopular in some parts of the, of the uh, you know, constituencies and certainly the unions. Yeah. A real quick one. One of the reasons I'm an optimist is technologies move, never move faster. And what you see with devices like the Apple and your two or three year old child or grandchild using it is this will completely change productivity, standard of living, health care, etc. So I think we're on probably a decade run of job creation, productivity, changing health care that it can really enable new business models and government models. So I'm going to put the burden back on us. I think we have a chance both as business and government to reinvent ourselves. Both organizations have to do it. And, and to your point. I'm the optimist that we can muddle through this at first and then pick up steam, yeah. like Duncan probably articulated earlier. Yeah. Room for the upside on the second yeah, half of the year. Yeah. And, 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 and someone just has to go first, that's all. Right? Yeah, I mean, right. And I think what we say to a lot of business leaders is if everyone's sitting around waiting for clarity from all the world's governments in one of the most uncertain times where we've lived in, we're not going to get it. Mm. We make decisions in our business lives every day without perfect information. It's what we're supposed to be good at and what we get compensated to do. So let's just do it. Let's lead from the front. And you know what? If we lead from the front, I don't think it's that difficult for the governments to turn the dial and throw in with us what's more bipartisan than job creation. I mean, I, 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 it's, and it's, it's literally the world's biggest issue right now. That's what this whole forum should be about. That's our biggest problem right now. I do agree. I would say your, yes. your point about it's certainty and uncertainty, we have to deal with that exactly Everybody. all the time. Yeah. Don't scream for certainty. Yeah. We, we'll never have certainty. Never I, I yeah. think if we together yeah. lead, business has a lot more to contribute right. without pointing blame to yep. others. Take it on, Absolutely. we can do it. On the other hand, I think we should be aware that, you know, and, and John, you mentioned about the, the middle class that has uh, been hurting in, in, in the U.S., and not only in the U.S., Everywhere. I think in many parts we see the rising inequality, and, and uh, people feel that certainly in the past, you know, you, you, you could have a job, and it was therefore much longer than it is today. We see a lot more uh, uncertainty about uh, uh, job security, and, and therefore I think people craze for a government to, uh, to, to come in to protect their jobs, to uh, subsidize things and so forth. And, uh, and I think that, that uh, you know, I, I think, you know, if, if uh, we, we're not creating the jobs, we will see a lot more government uh, pushing in and, and making life more difficult. That's why I think what you said, Duncan, about leading, taking the lead is so important. You know, what's interesting if you, and this kills me saying this being a Republican, but if you watch what President Clinton did, he did a very great model. You grew GDP for uh, eight years at 4% plus per year. You created 22 million jobs. Uh, of those 22 million, 92% of them were private sector. You had very good cooperation after a slow start, but very good cooperation between business and government. And I think we need to get back to, regardless of your political views, that type of basis around the world. And, and Pat, just on you, I mean, given that you have, your product is a very social product, if you, if you like, in many ways. You know, obviously there, the, the uh, interaction with governments, uh, there's the talk about land grab and all these things, you know, how, how, do, you, how do you deal with those and, you know, and find it, well, find it more difficult, I'm sure. There's today. probably not two other things that government is more concerned about, about their people than food and energy, and we're involved in both of those. Yes. Um, so we need to work cooperatively, and we do with governments uh, making the issues known. And I think thinking about the long term, the more governments turn inward and try to protect their own markets, try to put boycotts, try to put embargoes, blockades, um, the worse it is for exactly. the ultimate uh, outcome. So we spend a lot of time sharing what open trade is all about and what 
how the benefits of open trade can actually benefit individual countries as well as cross-border trade. Very good. Well, I think Hans, there are so many a answers to, to those questions. I mean, if I just think on some of the things that, that Alcoa is doing. I mean, we are investing currently $11 billion in Saudi Arabia with a partner. This is going to create 5,000 jobs in the area of the east of Saudi Arabia where youth unemployment is the biggest I issue. I was just there. The biggest Absolutely. issue. Absolutely. We've now started, as this thing is coming along, uh, we've, and I've just visited before, before the holidays, you know, we've now started to ramp up the hiring process as well as the education process. I was very concerned about how would the educational and the attitudinal level be. So we're starting a vocational training, which is a little bit like what we've seen in the German environment, right? I tell you what, it is absolutely amazing because there is this human thing. You know, when you give people education, they just flourish, right? When I go to Brazil, where we are big time invested, and, and we've built our Brazilian system, when I talk to the normal shop floor employees, I, t I, I tell you, it's not rare that I meet somebody who says, if you hadn't come here, I would not have had, I would not have had the chance to learn to read and write. Mm. It's not rare. And these are the things that we are seeing literally every day. Right? And I, in a way, this message has gotten lost, right? And I think that's where Duncan was coming from. We need to make sure that it's well understood and at the same time see, but we've got to work together. In the U.S., we have done with very little things. We've brought back the re-education process. For instance, we have shortages on welders in, in, in the U.S. We have shortages on, on industrial maintenance. Uh, uh, specialists, right? So we have started programs with community colleges where we offer these, these type of courses and, and allow people to go in there. Huge success. The costs are almost minimal, right? But they, they give people an opportunity to upgrade their skills, do it partially inside of the job, partially outside of the job, and increase their employability. And literally, what can you give today more than employability? I can guarantee, I mean, how in 10 years our business is going to look yep. like. But I, but I can be helpful in bringing the skill level up so that, that they are more employable. Good. Let's open it up to the can audience. Yeah. Sorry, well, Farid. Uh, going back to the regulation side, uh, unfortunately, regulation in certain countries and what took place in a couple of years created the regulators to be, to be very tough than they, had, they should be. And what this is bringing in one of our sectors, financial industry, financial services industry, and as a believer of globalization, for example, some of our entities overseas, unfortunately, even though we have a better balance sheet, even though we have a better liquidity management, even though we have a better capital advocacy ratio, we are being treated unfairly. And this regulation is creating what we don't want in the world for the globalization, protectionism. And people like us who want to grow, who want to not only bring values, wealth, job creation only to our country, but to the region, to other countries as well, we are being treated as un very unfairly. This is just a warning. Okay, good. Let's open it up to, to the audience and, you know, when we have questions, you know, it is a single sentence with a question mark at the end um, and no, you know, great uh, statement. Um, so one sentence with a question mark at the end and please introduce yourself also in three words. Please. So who are uh, uh, John Manley from Canada. Um, last night, President Obama uh, promised uh, aggressive action against those who compete unfairly and said that if the playing field is level, America will always win. He said that he would reward companies who created jobs and punish those who outsource jobs. Impact on global business conditions? Question mark. <laughs> so who wants to take this on? I mean, John, I mean, I'm sure you, you know, you have also listened at least, you know, to parts of that. What's your reaction? I never get confused with comments that go on during an election year with what long term needs to be done. Uh, you can't put a wall around a city or a country and keep people in that, capital in it, or others. 
Uh, I think in the U.S. we have the opportunity in front of us to be very competitive on a global scale and is probably one of the very few high-tech companies that have been around for 25 years. The majority of our employees are still in the U.S. But we've got to create an environment that allows us to address future growth in the U.S., which I want to do badly, of which repatriation is just one more example of where our government is out of touch with every other major development in the world. So I think what we have to do is say, how do you create an environment where it's predictability in the jobs that you add? And I think whichever political candidate this next election year is able to generate the confidence of job growth, that's probably going to be the one who wins. Okay. Pat, do you want to? Go I on. just wanted to say I flew in this morning, so I didn't see the speech live, but I read it on the three-hour trip mm -hmm. uh, from Zurich. and. I think there was a lot about the future vision that even links to some of the things we talked about here of trying to have business and government grow jobs together. I thought the point of that you made around outsourcing and punishing or um, rewarding those that here, it's got to be an and world where global growth, economic growth that adds jobs wherever they add them is a positive. And one of the things that the president mentioned in the speech is around exports in the United States. And growing jobs in the U.S. that help support exports uh, is, is uh, on the upswing. And exports are continuing to grow in the yep. U.S. And that continues to add to some of the uh, opportunity set. Right. And, you would, and I think you would hope on the back of that, that to, to what was just said, that if, if that starts to get out there, what, what, what Patricia just shared, then we can start to get to the point where the, the developed world understands that we're rooting a lot for the emerging world to be successful, right? We want China to get it right. We want India to get it right. We want Latin America to get it right. We want Africa to get it right because that's going to be a great boost to competitive companies in the developed world because there's half a billion to a billion new potential customers, consumers, you name it. And that's the kind of information that has to get out there, right? We, some of these comments, and I'm with, I, I flew in overnight also, so I didn't see it live. It, it, it it's too easily gets interpreted as a zero-sum game, right? And it's not a zero-sum exactly. game, exactly. right? That's exactly. the challenge, yeah. right? But can I have, we should not underestimate uh, protectionist tendencies. By the way, not just Especially in the U.S., yes, everywhere. there's election time, but, uh, but also in Europe. I mean, in countries where you have low growth, zero growth, negative growth, these tendencies are, are clearly there, and I think it's in us business leaders to, to really make the effort to, to convince politicians, political decision makers, that uh, it's not a zero-sum game, that's a win-win, that globalization still is a win-win. Is a I'm, not, I'm not sure we've done enough on that one. I'm very worried about these tendencies on both sides of the Atlantic, I have to say. Good. Another question. Mike is coming. Thanks. Uh, Andy Robinson, La Vanguardia, which is the daily newspaper in Barcelona. Um, <clears throat> The, the, both at this Davos and last year's Davos, there seemed to be a growing body of opinion amongst economists. Raghu Rajan, um, uh, even the, one, of, one of the Chinese uh, chief economists at the IMF, that uh, economic inequality is actually detrimental to uh, economic growth because it tends to sort of uh, create a kind of bubble-oriented um, uh, economic growth model where a, a minority with a growing uh, um, share of, of income, uh, invest in uh, volatile financial assets, <clears throat> whereas the rest of us are forced to consume based on increasing indebtedness. Uh, now, I wonder, just the question is, do you think that's true? And if so, would you be prepared as members of that uh, small minority who do uh, 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 who, 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 who have been beneficiaries of growing income polarization, would you be prepared to take a smaller share? Thanks. Klaus, do you want to? I mean, I don't That's want to put you in the spot. I wasn't waiting for that. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, think, I think I would start at a little bit of a different point. I think that uh, to run societies successfully and for societies to, to excel, you need a very intense dialogue of all forces and you need it with an open open mind and and uh, really to, to to deliver a joint understanding at the same time 
I mean, it is not income distribution that creates jobs. Let's be clear. It is competitive businesses that find jobs for, for employees to pay them well, you know, and, and give them future opportunities. And you have to always build in an economic agenda in, in this. Otherwise, you run into those traps that I have seen people running in. Uh, my f major part of my family was stuck in East Germany, and I was sent there often enough in my youth to experience an environment like that. And that's certainly nothing that I found desirable at all, and I believe that we've learned good lessons from what to do better. And frankly, I mean, in 2008, 2000, it was 2000, I think it was 2009 or so, October 2009, when I was in Moscow and uh, in the US, it was at the height of the points of government bailouts and um, partial uh, government investments in large US companies. And I was talking to an old friend of mine in Russia, and I said, well, look, I mean, this is about to happen here, too, I assume, with the oligarchs, you know. And he looks at me with, I mean, like uh, deer in the headlights. I mean, his eyes pop, uh, pop wide open. And he looks at me and says, Klaus, I mean, in Russia, I mean, we know that the government can never do a better job in distributing the money than, than, than business can, right? So, uh, uh, well, I mean, Hans, you're shaking your head, but in the end, I think that's a lesson. That's a lesson that we, that, that we should not forget. And people that have lived in such environments uh, understand how difficult it can be. But the core of the issue is that it needs social responsibility in the business leaders, and it needs an understanding of how different parts of society feel. Right? That's my caveat, and it's a strong caveat to that. Right? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to plus just disagree slightly on that. Uh, I think it should be a, a, an embarrassment to American business, as good as we are, not to have a rising middle class. And I think we've got to say, how do we turn this trend around? You don't have political stability in any country without a middle class. The Russians get this in Skokovo, which many of us are working on. Turkey clearly understands it. Make no mistake, the Chinese and Indians understand it. So I think we've got to create an environment that allows a win-win on that. And I think the old definition of capitalism by itself uh, is, is not the future. It's, it's how do we create an environment where the majority of the citizens in a country in the world uh, win together. And actually, technology probably knocks that down for the first time. My parents taught me it was all about education was the equalizer in life. Not true anymore. It's about technology, the internet, and education allowing you to participate. And we ought to be able to increase the standard of living of the majority of citizens of this world every year on an ongoing basis. And I think business has to, to think more out of box in how we do that. I do. But John, so, that's so, not a disagreement. I, I believe I you're right, but I, I do not, I, I, but I do not <laughs> believe that it's just the middle class. I think your point at the end is you've got to lead to wealth creation throughout society and, not, and wealth creation, the fundamentals of wealth creation are also education. So, so in a way, wealth creation is like looking in the back mirror, right? You at the same time you have to bring in the substantials which come through uh, through education. Very, you know, from you give us the Turkish perspective because they are obviously, you know, um, the development has uh, led to a rising middle class. Yes. I'm not sure whether the income inequality has really improved, but uh, it's. Uh, I don't think it has worsened. I think with the with the with the uh, strong economic growth. It has not worsened, but still, ratio-wise. We have more to go. We have to do better. Uh, and the whole picture is not very different from US, Europe, or anywhere in the world. Middle class is very important. And uh, I also believe that because of the last eight years that economy started growing, that's why the middle class started growing more. So of course the business have to be socially responsible. We can, I, mean, I mean, you can see the old pictures of a uh, factory owner or a boss, uh, fat with a cigar, uh, just looking at the employees from a different perspective. Those days are gone. I mean, capitalism should find a mix with socially accepted way of doing business as well. And I think this goes through touching the people, doing the right things, not treating the people badly, and being socially responsible in the public. But we talked all about this problem. One thing we are missing, 
the duty of media. Because sometimes, unfortunately, in these countries, media is showing or creating us against them type of things. I mean, the last three years, who are the most hated people in the world? Bankers. We all live in this society. People made mistakes. But look at the, uh, also the uh, contribution of banking system or financial system to this world. So for the uh, wealth creation, for uh, the, the, the capitalism to be understood rightfully, uh, I think the communicating of realities without distorting pictures or creating enemies is also will create a climate where we will have the right timing to do things better. Otherwise, politicians are being squeezed, business leaders being squeezed, there is a push from the social pressures, and I think media will play a very important picture in this, doing the right communication to the public. Absolutely. We have a lady over here. Can you get her, some, her mic? I'm Jasmine Whitbread from Save the Children. Um, it's interesting that um, the conversation has now turned on to social responsibility, really prompted by a question from the audience. And also, as listening before, the tone can sometimes come across as a little plaintive in terms of, we are doing a lot of good. Why don't people understand? You know, why doesn't the media tell the story? Now, I happen to know that a number of your companies um, are involved in very impressive multi-stakeholder uh, initiatives to tackle really big issues in the world and yet none of you chose this opportunity um, to really even mention any of those even in passing um, focusing instead on, on more of the short term um, and, you know in the leadership challenges generally and I just wondered why you think that is and whether you might want to mention a couple of them now actually it's not quite true I think the social uh, question was came up very early in, in the statements, uh, if I may correct you. But you, if you look at it, and I'll just use Cisco as an example, and each one of us could paint our picture that way. I said earlier we gave 3.75 of pre-tax income on corporate social responsibility. Bear with me, let me finish. Uh, and one of the reasons I go to Davos is the ability of business and government and NGOs to all work together toward a common goal. Our network academies is the number one education in the world by private sector with a million students in that uh, and 160 countries working very closely together. The issues in terms of Palestine where you work with Shimon Perez and King Abdullah Jordan and the Palestinians and all the religious groups to say how do you create jobs there starting with corporate social responsibility and then building business out of it. You go on to Lebanon and, and do the same scenario. In China after the terrible earthquake in Sichuan province the ability to go in and work at the invitation of the State Department and the Chinese government to rebuild build that part of the country with health care <laughs> systems that last and education systems that last. And do the same thing after Katrina uh, down in Louisiana and Mississippi where we spent $90 million but more importantly made a difference in the education system. It took NGOs working with government, working with business and I think that's what the WEF is all about. It's how do we bring together these ideas and solve them together because one of us solving it by ourselves clearly does not work. Uh, I think all of us are hesitant because when we talk about it, it looks self-serving, but I give you the chance. I, I thank you for the opportunity to perhaps summarize it. That's right. I mean, probably what you say, do good things and then talk about them. And we have been maybe a bit more uh, reluctant, although, I, as you know, I mean, we, the BCG is working very closely with Save the Children. And I think all of you, I mean, like John has mentioned, Pat Duncan, uh, Tom uh, Ferret, and, and Klaus, I think they are all engaged in local groups and in regional groups and in global groups. And the key thing... Tom. Point being that it's uh, not about, and I know you correct, you moved on. It's not about
to go through this cycle, some of them, after the courses, you see the tears in their eyes saying, <clears throat> you know, I've been teaching for 13 years. First time I started feeling that being a teacher is a different ball game. And the last one, many kids in Turkey, we have a foundation, family foundation. Uh, we looked into statistics. There were a lot of school dropouts in the eastern part of Turkey uh, because they didn't succeed in the first, second grade. Believe it or not, we sent a couple of trucks with eyesight checking doctors. Many of them, it was that they were not even aware of the fact that they need a glass. Thank you. Good. Thanks. So I would like to thank the uh, panel, obviously, uh, and the audience for, I think, a very engaged discussion. Clearly, I mean, what we can take away, I think globalization will continue. It will bring a lot of opportunities, uh, and we will deal with the short-term challenges uh, and make it work. Thank you very much. Very, thanks very much, Will. Thanks. Thanks. Very good. Very good. Okay, good.